Today I'm going to be talking about African horse sickness. African horse sickness, also known as AHS, is a non-contagious, insect-borne, hemorrhagic, infectious disease commonly found in horses. While it's primarily found in horses, it has also been reported in other species. Horses and mules are most susceptible and experience severe disease and highly high fatality rates. European and Asian donkeys are less susceptible, with African donkeys and zebras being the least susceptible. They rarely experience significant disease or mortality. There's actually nine antigenically distinct stereotypes of the virus that causes AHS. Some are cross-protective, however, stereotype nine is responsible for the most outbreaks. AHS is endemic to tropical equatorial regions and generally spreads from south to north. It is a transbound disease in the U.S., therefore any suspicion of AHS being present must be immediately reported to the USDA for further investigation. AHS is caused by a virus known as Rio Verde orbivirus. Another cause is midges, which are similar to mosquitoes. These are the transport route of the virus. Worst factors for AHS include importation of infected equids from AHS endemic countries or infected animal products such as serum or semen from these countries. Introduction of infected vectors such as through planes as well as windborne carriage of these infected vectors. There's several ways that AHS can be transmitted. A common way is through direct contact, such as through a barn mate who might already have the virus for AHS in it. Another common way is insect transmission from midges, as we already discussed. And AHS is seasonal with outbreaks occurring due to weather, and it's frequently associated with periods of drought followed by heavy rain. Another common way is injection of infected blood or organ suspensions from another animal that has already infected with AHS. And it's especially risky if the injection occurs through uh, intravenous. And viremia, which is once the animal already has the virus within its body, they can transmit it to others for a period of four to eight days. However, this can last up to a period of 21 days. And there is an incubation period for the virus to actually become virulent. This is typically 7 to 14 days. However, it can be less, but it can also last as long as 21 days. So this is a chart of the uh, infection, uh, how the infection occurs of um, AHS, starting with, the, you know, the host getting bit by um, midges which are going to carry the virus and it, how quickly it can just pass to other horses and especially within these different um, period time periods seasonal periods of the year and um, also tells you how the vector survives to continue so there's actually four different kinds of AHS based on the clinical signs that the animal presents. The first kind is pulmonary, also known as Dunkop in Africa. Dunkop meaning thin head. So this is an acute to paracute form of AHS. Foals are particularly susceptible to this form as their maternal antibodies weigh in around three months of age. The clinical signs include a fever up to 106 degrees Fahrenheit, depression, Profuse sweating, injection of the conjunctiva, also known as bloodshot eyes, as you'll see on the right, severe pulmonary edema, dyspnea or difficulty breathing, coughing, frothy nasal discharge, as you'll see on the left, and this onset of dyspnea is quite sudden, and the progression of pulmonary AHS can last anywhere from hours to days after the clinical signs set. And this form has the highest fatality rate of all the different forms with a fatality rate up to 95%. The second form of AHS is cardiac, also known as DICOP in Africa, 
which is known as thick head due to the amount of edema that occurs within the head. This is the subacute form of AHS. And the clinical signs include a fever up to 106 degrees Fahrenheit, depression, supraorbital non-pinning edema, which you can see her on the left, right above the eye, and inversion of conjunctiva, also known as extropion. You'll see that here on the right. Uh, edema of the head, neck, thorax, pectorals, and shoulders, and dysfunction of upper, the upper airways and esophagus in cases with severe edema in the head. And it can also cause periodic recumbency and colic. The disease progression for the cardiac form lasts anywhere from four to eight days after the initial onset of these clinical signs. And it has a fatality rate around 50%. However, that can be more than that. The third form is a mixed form. This is a combination of cardiac and pulmonary forms. This is also the most common form of AHS seen. And the initial evidence of AHS occurs in the pulmonary form, followed by edematous swelling and effusions. Signs include acute coughing, frothy nasal discharge, and collapse. Um, and death often occurs from cardiac failure three to six days after the initial onset. And this form has around a 70% fatality. Our last form is the fever or febrile form. This is the mildest or subclinical form, and it's not often diagnosed clinically, clinically due to this. It's normally seen in partially immune horses and in donkeys and zebras. It's most likely to occur in previously well immunized animals, but have also occurred in naive animals suspected to have some innate resistance. The so signs include moderate malaise, which is just a general discomfort, a fever around 104 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit, which lasts for anywhere from one to several days, anorexia, depression, occasional mild conjunctivitis, which you can see on the right, which is similar to pink eye, um, dyspnea, and again, edema of the supraorbital fossa. This form though, since it is the mildest form, has a rapid recovery and therefore has a very low and very rare fatality rate. So in terms of diagnosis for AHS, it is not possible to do so before the clinical signs develop. This is because in order for a veterinarian to diagnose AHS, there is a large number of differentials they must go through. And this is because the signs of AHS is very similar to a large different amount of other problems with horses. Um, some of these include acute heart failure, pneumonia, equine infectious anemia, anthrax, different types of tachycosis and poisoning, and the list goes on. In order to actually get diagnosis, diagnostics to get a diagnosis of AHS, federal and state health officials must be involved in any suspected case because they are in charge of determining the diagnostic tests that will be used. Um, but the samples generally include unclotted whole blood and serum from live animals. And in the cases of any dead animals, the serum is collected from the spleen, lungs, lymph nodes, um, etc. So the tests that can be done include the duplex real-time reverse transcription PCR assay, and this detects the virus itself. Another one is VP7 blocking ELISA for determination of serum antibodies for, of the virus. And type-specific RT-PCR assay um, can actually de detect the um, specific stereotype of AHS. 
and this can actually do this within a few hours whereas previous versions took up to five days to get a result. And this is the actual um, diagram of how type specific RT PCR assay works because um, this is the most common um, test done currently. In terms of treatment and control or prevention, uh, vaccination remains the main form of control for AHS, especially in endemic countries. And there's many different forms of the vaccine, such as live attenuated, that are commercially available, uh, such as the one you see on the bottom right. Um, and these are generally good, but they don't always provide absolute protection. Therefore, annual revaccination is recommended, especially in areas where um, these vaccines are used. And there's different concerns with these vaccines, but overall, it's still the best way to prevent AHS. And in terms of prevention, there's many different ways to do so. But the most recommended ways include stabling during peak vector activity hours, which are from dusk to dawn, and um, spraying insecticides or repellents uh, on the horses themselves, such as the product you see on the top right, um, and as well as spraying it within the whole barn to keep you know the midges out of the barn so that you can decrease the transmission. And ideal products will have 15% DEET as well as permethrin in them. Another good way for prevention is to use a double door system to prevent that direct contact between any infected animal as well as positive pressure ventilation to decrease any airborne transmission. And it is important to note that all of these recommendations and Treatment options and such are from these sources here, which are very great sources. However, you should always consult your veterinarian if you suspect AHS or with any questions you may have, as they are the ones who can make this diagnosis. So if you'd like to learn more, here's some great sites, um, but thank you for listening.